Hello and Hi. welcome everybody. Hi, um, welcome to Migraine uh, Canada's first event where we are going to be uh, starting a series uh, with guests to talk about subjects that we are always getting questions um, from our uh, followers, from our viewers on different social media um, platforms. And we are very happy to have uh, Lauren Wooten with us today on our first broadcast. And we are going to be going over um, her experience. We're going to ask about her experience um, managing vertigo and vestibular migraine symptoms, but also her physiotherapy experience and how people living with migraine can benefit from this, um, from this resource that we have uh, here in Canada. Thank you very much and welcome, uh, Lauren. It's it's such a pleasure to have you. This is the second time that we've had an um, an event together, and um, it's always a pleasure to, to to talk to you because every time I talk to you, I also learn something. New. <laughs> welcome to Migraine Canada and to Ask the Pharmacist, and and we're looking forward to hearing your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored and I'm happy to, to share what I know as to uh, hopefully help some people out there who uh, are dealing with vertigo and vestibular migraine. Thank you. So I will start today by just asking you, like, what kind of education is um, required for someone to be a, a, a physiotherapist or a physical therapist? Yeah, so uh, physiotherapist, I, w I have a master's um, degree in physiotherapy. That's what you need nowadays to uh, to become a registered physiotherapist. So um, I'm a, I have my master's from McMaster, graduated in 2012. And then um, there are lots of branches of physio that you can sort of go off into after graduating. So you graduate with sort of a general degree and then there's lots of continuing education that you can do. So um, about five or six years into my career, I started to take a few more um, courses on um, vestibular therapy and I uh, found it really interesting and fascinating and really rewarding as well. You can help um, help a lot of people quite a bit uh, with vestibular therapy. So um, I've just since then been taking as much uh, extra education in that as I can and, and really um, kind of focusing in on that, uh, that, that branch of physiotherapy. And if, uh, if, if I was living in, in uh, Ontario or in Canada and I wanted to find uh, someone to help me and if I had migraine and I wanted to find someone to help me with my symptoms, how do I find the right physiotherapist for me? How do I ensure that this is uh, the, the right physiotherapist for me? Yeah, that's a good question. So if it, if it's a vestibular migraine, that is your main issue. So we'll, we'll talk about what that is in a few minutes. But if that's your main concern, then usually a vestibular physiotherapist is your best bet. So finding a therapist um, locally who, uh, who has a good amount of extra training in vestibular therapy. Sometimes it's just a weekend course, um, and I find that that can be helpful. But if you can find someone who has more um, more training, even like a, a a competency level course or exam um, that they've done, that uh, that can be can be what you want to look for in a in a therapist migraine in general, so other forms of migraine, um, I would say finding a physiotherapist, first of all, well, it, there's no specific kind of designation as a migraine physiotherapist, so it's hard to, to say, but I would say looking, if you can get to speaking with one, asking, you know, what their experience is, but also um, if you're looking on their website, looking at their profile and seeing what they say their specialties are or what they say their special interests are, and if migraine is in there, then that's a, that's a good chance that they're, they're going to have a special interest in that and some extra um, education around that as well. And... Um... When um, when someone comes to you, um, what do you expect them to come uh, prepared? Like how how would you define prepared as uh, someone who's coming to see you for the first time? What 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 kind of information would you like to see before you start working with them? That's a that's a great question. Yeah. So um, you know, being prepared is is great. I love to have a a client who comes in even if it doesn't have to be written down, but a lot of times they will come with kind of a written list of what their symptoms are. So they're not kind of just 
thinking about it, but they've kind of thought ahead what exactly their symptoms are, what they know that their triggers are, um, how many episodes they've had in the past, you know, few months, um, what they've tried so far. It's always important to know what people have tried because you don't want to just start trying all the same things again if they've already tried these things and not had success. So um, what they've tried, what's worked, what hasn't worked, what, you know, also what, what their, obviously what their medical history and whatnot is, but what, um, what kind of testing they've had done in the past. So have they had any imaging done and so on, what specialists they're seeing. Those are all the things that I ask um, during the appointment and, and, uh, and it's always helpful if someone, you know, is a little bit more prepared and, and has that um, kind of pre thought out for sure. Um, I'm, I, I know that you have prepared some slides for us yeah. today, so I can ask you much more. <laughs> um, it, it, but I think we, we can start by just um, sharing if you would like us to start um, sharing your slides. Yeah. And we'll go back. If, if, you are, if you've just joined us, thank you very much. Uh, I can see already we have, uh, um, um, we have viewers online. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, tonight, uh, please leave us your comments uh, or in the comment section, send us your questions and uh, we would be very happy to answer them. Um, Lauren, I'm going to leave the floor to you. Perfect. And... Okay. Yeah, if you can share the presentation, I think, and then I can start. There we go. Perfect. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about vestibular migraine, as I said um, earlier. Uh, I'll just introduce myself a little bit further. I'm a registered physiotherapist in Ontario. Um, I, I live in Burlington, but I actually own a practice called the the vertigo therapist and we are um, a completely virtual vestibular therapy practice so we don't have a brick and mortar clinic um, myself and my colleague zoe we uh, work from home and we um, we do all of our treatments and assessments all through video conference um, there's not a lot that needs to be done hands-on for vestibular uh, or sorry for vestibular therapy so a lot of it we can teach you how to do the strategies exercises um, and and so on at home uh, so it's a great way to uh, to get your therapy in, in a convenient way through uh, through virtual means. Um, so that's that's a little bit about me. Um, what we're going to talk about today, uh, well, first we're going to talk about the difference between vertigo and dizziness. Then we will talk about what is vestibular migraine, if you haven't heard of it before or aren't quite sure who gets that type of migraine, um, what are some associated disorders that are similar to vestibular migraine or might come alongside of it, and then how can vestibular therapy or physi physiotherapy help? So starting with vertigo, it's defined as an illusion of motion. So either you feel yourself moving or you feel that your environment or that the room is moving. Um, it doesn't have to be a spinning sensation, although that's often what's associated with the term vertigo. Um, it may just be like a like a you know a rocking sensation or a, um, a, a jolting sensation, a dropping sensation. Those are all different sensations that you may um, feel with the term vertigo. And then the word dizziness is a little more nonspecific. Um, it's, uh, it's more uh, of a lightheadedness, a disorientation, um, not as much of a motion of more of just kind of a, a foggy, dizzy, um, kind of stuffy kind of feeling in the head. It's a little more vague, obviously, and, and it's a one that's a little bit harder to nail down for people. Um, it, it, sometimes people can just say, I can't describe it, it just doesn't feel right. Um, so vestibular migraine, um, if you know that, um, we know that about 10% of the population in um, North America has a migraine disorder. And in that third bubble there, one in three of those people with migraine experience vestibular symptoms being the vertigo dizziness kind of category. So that's a lot of people um, with vestibular migraine. 20% um, of women childbearing age, so um, kind of middle-aged women have migraine. So that's a that's a huge, huge amount of people uh, with um, with migraine and, and that one in three of them having the vestibular symptoms. Um, it's a hugely prevalent disorder, but uh, very under-recognized um, and deserves a lot more awareness. Um, so vestibular migraine, it's a migraine with predominantly vertigo and dizziness. So 
a lot of people with typical migraine will also have some, you know, nausea, um, dizziness, vertigo, but this is, this is the predominant symptom and it. Um, there's, there does not have to be head pain, although there can be, um, some, that's what makes it challenging to diagnose initially as well. People will go to their, um, ER or family doctor or whatever, and have just vertigo and dizziness, these kind of episodes of intense vertigo and dizziness um, with not a lot of other symptoms. So they, there's a lot of investigating that goes on to try to figure out what's going on. Um, and then when you look a little bit closer and, and uh, whatnot, we determine that it is a vestibular migraine, um, that they're having these vertigo attacks um, and it's due to a migraine disorder, even though they're not necessarily having um, any headache accompany, accompanying it. So it can be episodic where, you know, these, these attacks come and go, or it can be chronic um, where the, um, the episodes are a little bit more constant and there's maybe an ebb and flow, but you never get back to kind of that 100%. Um, <clears throat> there are some triggers that are unique to vestibular migraine, but also um, overlap with traditional migraine as well. So head movement is one of them that can be a big trigger. Um, motion rich environments. So imagine being at Canada's wonderland where there are people everywhere, there's rides going off everywhere. There's a lot of spinning happening. Um, so that's sort of a motion rich environment. Sometimes sports games can be another one where there's a lot of, you know, movement of team members and balls and your head is moving back and forth watching a game. Um, grocery stores is another one that's a big trigger. It's a little bit different in that there's not a ton of motion, uh, but there is a lot of visual stimulus. So um, a lot of things in aisles and racks and products and colors and patterns. So a lot of that kind of visual stimulation can be um, very triggering. Uh, screens, computer screens, phone screens, and just that scrolling motion of, of that um, movement can be a trigger. Um, patterns, as I said, hormonal changes, that's a huge one. I find a lot of my patients say that their vestibular migraines or their symptoms in general start uh, you know either um, around the time of menstruation sometimes a few days before or they notice it or their or their symptoms are kind of coming up and starting in a time in their life where their um, hormones have changed so whether they've just become pregnant or just postpartum or just um, going into menopause those are some really common times where vestibular migraine gets triggered for the first time um, sleep disturbances, stress, caffeine, weather changes, light, all of those kind of typical migraine triggers can also trigger vestibular migraine. So the diagnostic criteria for vestibular migraine, this is if uh, your doctor wants to um, diagnose it um, uh, very um, by the book, would be having at least five episodes of vestibular symptoms of moderate or severe intensity that last five minutes to 72 hours. So 72 hours being, you know, a three day long migraine, um, but they can be as short as five minutes. You do for this um, uh, diagnosis need to have a previous history of migraine with or without aura. So um, that's where I'm saying, you know, your migraines can change over your lifetime. So if in your younger adulthood, you have typical migraines, and then after having children or after going through menopause, um, you don't get me people say my migraines went away, I didn't get them as much anymore. And then they come in and see me saying that they're having these um, vertigo spells. Uh, it's likely that they um, that this is a vestibular migraine because of their history of having um, a different type of migraine. Um, one or more of the features with at least one or more migraine features with at least 50% of the vestibular episodes. So they have to have um, headache with with at least 50 of them, 50% 50 of them have to have had headache or photopho photophobia, phonophobia. So that's the light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, or visual aura. So just a, um, a one of these features has to accompany it. Uh, and it's not better accounted for by another vestibular diagnosis. So there's so much overlap in vestibular uh, conditions that you do have to make sure it's not something else before you slap this label on it as well. Um, uh, who gets vestibular migraine? Women um, mostly, although I do see several men with it as well, um, but six times more likely in women. Um, genetic predisposition. So very often people will say, my mother had vertigo, my grandmother had vertigo. Um, it really does run down in the family. Um, 
you know, increased stress traumatic events will be another one that's a big trigger for the first episode. Um, it is linked to um, uh, depression as well as vitamin and nutrient deficiencies such as D, CoQ10, riboflavin, magnesium, as we know, they're all um, common migraine um, triggers when you have deficiencies in those um, and the hormonal changes as I mentioned as well as concussions and brain injuries are another big one um, that uh, that will predispose you to getting vestibular migraines associated conditions so these are the ones that um, that are sometimes diagnosed um, uh, misdiagnosed as vestibular migraine or um, or um, um, associated with vestibular migraine. So vestibular migraine is often um, misdiagnosed as Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease is actually quite rare. Uh, it gets overdiagnosed um, when um, when a specialist or a doctor isn't quite sure or, or unaware of vestibular migraine because they have very similar symptoms. Um, Perilymphatic fistula, that's a, an inner ear disorder. Vestibular neuritis is caused from an inner ear infection. Um, actually, the vestibular neuritis, that's an interesting one because, and BPPV, because a lot of times people will come to me after years of vertigo problems and say, my doctor told me I had vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis, but it happens every three months. I keep getting vestibular neuritis. Well, that is very that, that is not really possible. You can't get vestibular neuritis uh, in a cyclical way. You can't get repeated episodes of, of vestibular neuritis. It's just not something that happens. Um, vestibular neuritis happens once, maybe twice in a lifetime. But if you're having recurrent vertigo, uh, it's likely not due to inner ear infections. Um, so so that's one that will get you know um, misdiagnosed as well. Allergies, sinus problems um, uh, under my um, picture there, or maybe you can't see that, but um, panic attacks and, and psychological disorders often get um, get labeled, uh, misdiagnosed as, um, uh, or vestibular migraine gets misdiagnosed as a more psychological disorder as well. Um, the other column here, vestibular migraine actually occurs at the same time as these conditions often. Um, so vestibular migraine can happen at the same time as having BPPV, which is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. That's the one where um, there are small calcium carbonate crystals in the inner ear that um, start to float into a space where they're not supposed to be and cause these positional uh, vertigo attacks. Um, if you have vestibular migraine, you're more likely to also suffer from BPPV occasionally. So those two can go hand in hand. Uh, another one that vestibular migraine commonly goes along with is something called PPPD or 3PD. Um, and that's uh, that's persistent postural perceptual disorder. Um, that's a whole other topic that I can't get into now because it's uh, we would be here all day. But that's another one that it goes, off, goes um, along with quite often. Malda debarkment syndrome is another one, as well as anxiety and depression are so, so commonly um, intertwined with vestibular migraine. So uh, what does a vestibular therapist or physiotherapist do for our vestibular migraine? That's kind of what I do. Um, we do exercises because that's what physiotherapists do, but we do more than just give you exercises. So um, first things first, we do individualized programs that are created based on what your symptoms are, what you know, what we find in the assessment. Is it your balance that's um, that's needing work? Is it your visual coordination with your head movement that needs work? Um, is it habituation, which is more kind of desensitization type, type exercises that you might need? Um, neck and posture exercises are huge. And then relaxation and coping strategies to deal with when you are going through a um, an attack as well uh, we do a lot of education so teaching you you know why this is happening um, and uh, and the anatomy is just so that you understand it a little bit better um, we also help you along with any lifestyle changes that you may um, need and it's it's nice to have sort of a, a partner in that in that 
helps um, with accountability, right? So if it's one thing for your doctor to say um, you need to exercise more or you need to try a new diet, um, but if you have a, a physiotherapist that's seeing you on a regular basis, um, who you know is more invested in, and knows you really well and your symptoms really well, you're more likely to kind of stick to a plan. So that's what's nice about having um, a physiotherapist on your side as well. Um, it's that accountability as I have on the slide here. The other thing I do a lot of is help uh, help with other allied health professionals. So um, either writing notes to your specialists or doctors about any recommendations that I might have or um, other health professionals if there's um, psychological support that you need, if there's dietitians, pharmacists, um, um, you know, occupational therapy, all of those other things, I can help you coordinate and, and refer you to some of those specialists. Um, so that's that's kind of in a nutshell what I would do for someone with vestibular migraine. Um, I'll give you an example of an exercise that um, is commonly one of the first exercises I'll give people if they need this. Uh, it's an exercise where, and you can try this at home right now, all you have to do is stand up, put your feet together side by side. So I can't, I'll, I'll do it here with you. I don't know if you can see me. I'll back up a little bit. I'm going to stand up. Put my feet side by side here, hands down by my sides, and then try to just balance here for a second. If I feel steady enough and I'm close to a chair or a table to hold on to if I need to, um, so I'm going to keep my hand close to my desk, but I'm going to close my eyes. And I'm going to try and hold that with eyes closed for about 10 seconds. And you can see I'm swaying a little bit, and you may be as well too. And you can always touch down for a little bit of support. But being able to hold that position for 10 seconds um, is, uh, you should be able to hold that for 10 seconds normally. I will make that harder if that's easy for you and, and, and kind of challenge you a little bit more in your home exercise program. But that's a great exercise because what it's doing is it is... Um, taking your vision away from your balance system. So in what we use three different areas of our um, of our um, senses to help with balance. We use our vision, we use our inner ear, and we use our sense of touch. And those three areas um, come together to um, help us kind of balance and move around in space without falling over. So if we take our vision out of it and close our eyes, only left with a being able to use our inner ear and our touch and people with vestibular migraine or other vestibular conditions often are very reliant on their vision for balance uh, and that can be a problem because if we use our vision too much we're not using our other senses um, to kind of know where we are in the world and help with balance and if there's ever uh, a time where um, our vision isn't available or it's dark or there's things like that then our, our balance can get really poor so if we do this exercise, closing our eyes, we start to teach our brain to use our other systems a little bit more and kind of strengthen our vestibular system as well. Um, so virtual therapy. So as I mentioned, I'm a virtual vestibular physiotherapist. So this is just a slide about, you know, a lot of people have questions like, how does it work? I think I mentioned a couple of things in the beginning, but um, but but it's all about kind of teaching you your home program, talking to you, talking um, this, through the strategy with you and getting you to do things at home. Um, it's also really good for people who don't drive, you know, or or have time constraints and just need to get an appointment in quick while they're, you know, going through their day. Um, and it's awesome for people who live in more rural and remote areas who don't have vestibular physiotherapists around the corner. So that's the great thing. Thing about the, the virtual side of it. Um, so this is just how to reach me if you are interested in learning more about what we do. It's thevertigotherapist.com. We're on Facebook and Instagram, so follow us there for more um, tips. But um, see if we have any questions now, if anybody has anything that they want answered. Uh, so I can read some of the questions we have. So. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Lauren. Um, I'm going. I have a lot of questions, but yeah. we can start by um, asking. I have a question from Alex, and she's saying, "When would you recommend doing these types of exercises?" So I know this is one type of exercise that you've showed us today, mm -hmm. um, but the question is always number one: How many times a day do I need to do this? And yeah. that's the question I get from my patients as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when, 
So the exercises are always best to do at least once a day. Usually I'll recommend starting out twice a day. And the reason why I recommend that is, you know, it, it, you're getting it in um, and, and that's, you know, that exercise you're holding, you're only holding it about 10 seconds. So doing maybe two repetitions of that in the moment. And then again, later in the day, if you find that it, you know, increases your symptoms in it at all, I'll often kind of back off and maybe go to once a day or maybe only hold five seconds. Um, so that's where the, the kind of, you know, it's very individualized, but generally what I start at is kind of twice a day holding for 10 seconds. And then based on uh, what your response is to that, we can modify it from there. Um, then the question is, does that prevent uh, um, someone from having more vertigo or more dizziness spells? Is that preventive or is this something you do in the middle of an attack? Like if I'm really dizzy, is there something I can do? Like first, is this preventive what, or preventative? What mm -hmm. you're um, describing to us or what you have shown mm -hmm. us? No, so uh, generally not. So these exercises are going to be more helpful for what we call those interictal symptoms. So if you're having any unsteadiness or symptoms, dizziness and imbalance in between like a, an intense migraine attack, um, these can help to bring down those, those symptoms that you're having in between. It may help to prevent attacks in a way in that, um, you know, if your vestibular system is a little bit stronger, uh, you're less likely to have kind of visual overstimulus, you're less likely to kind of feel dizzy and, and unbalanced in certain situations, which may, which may be a trigger for you. So yes, in a way, it's slightly preventative, it's more, uh, but it's more to kind of strengthen things um, and make you, uh, a, you know, have stronger balance in between those um, attacks. But for your second question, what can I do during an attack? There's a there's another strategy that I'll, I'll teach you guys right now. Um, and it's something that can really help if you're feel if you're just feeling like, you're not grounded, like you feel like things are spinning, you feel like you're moving. Um, there's a couple of things, actually. One thing that I will recommend if people have, and if they're at home and if they have access to, is using a weighted blanket. So these are kind of all the rage right now. Lots of people have them or know where to get one or can borrow one to try it out. Um, but sitting in kind of a, a chair with a nice firm back and kind of lay, wrapping yourself in one of those weighted blankets, it really just helps to, you know, ground you and make your body feel like it's not moving as much. Um, and then another exercise that's sort of related to that and has a similar effect would be something called axial compression. And so that's where you, you sit up tall, you interlace your fingers, you put them on the kind of um, very top of your head as thinking if your spine is going straight up to the ceiling, you're thinking about gently just kind of putting some weight through your head down through your spine with your eyes open or closed. Some people when they have vertigo, it's hard to close their eyes, but some people find it more comfortable. So whatever is more comfortable for you, and you're just going to let the weight of your arms press down and it's having a similar effect as the weighted blanket, it's just going to make you feel like you're more connected to the ground instead of spinning up and you know out into space. So um, that's one that you can do at any time where you feel like um, you're having symptoms. So another question that, that I have, and it relates to actually me not being able to help um, my patients, and that is um, some of the, you talked about aura, and mm -hmm. there are, as, as you are very well aware there is a motor or where where there is a possibility that you lose some of your the strength on one side or if you like you're you're not as balanced mm -hmm. is this something that requires a different intervention uh, number one for me i want to make sure that everybody is uh is um is safe that's the number one priority and obviously mm -hmm. Um, if there are any coping exercises or mechanisms that you think we can uh, share. So you, so, um, so you're asking, is there any mechanism or coping, coping strategies for that specific type of aura? So there's weakness. Yeah. Sometimes there's a little bit of weakness mm -hmm. um, that is part of the aura. Mm -hmm. Is there, like, if you, I'm, I'm going to assume this is, possibly the symptoms some of, uh, of, of my patients describe it as, as um, they're not able to really walk straight or they feel mm -hmm. that one side of their body is a little bit weak mm -hmm. and there's always the risk of falls. Yes. Is that, how would you manage this? How would, how do you feel we can support? That's a, yeah, that is a tricky one. I mean, in the moment, I don't think there's much 
that you can do to reduce that unfortunately it's not like if you go you know and start using that arm or strengthen or do an exercise it's you, your strength is going to come back um once it's kind of going there's not a lot you can do it's more you know waiting it out taking your rescue medication or or whatever um <clears throat> so there's not unfortunately any you know magical exercise that's going to help with that but as you said keeping safe, making sure, you know, don't get up and walk around if you feel like you're unsteady. Um, do some of these kind of relaxation sort of um, techniques, um, the axial compression. The other one, if you're finding, if, if um, you're, you know, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, or, or just visual sensitivity, um, one that I'll often give people is, um, we call it cupping, where you just put your hands over your eyes, um, either sitting or lying down and you just do some deep breaths. So it's just a little bit more um, than just closing your eyes themselves. Having those hands right over top of the eyes can really help to kind of calm down any, you know, possible input that's going in there. Um, but yeah, for your question about the the motor um, um, uh, aura, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't have any, any tips for that one. Uh, and um, no, but thank you. You gave us that. Yeah, but um, and much. and most of the questions I know our series is asked the migraine pharmacist, but a lot of the questions I have are not really related to medicine or medications. Mm -hmm. A lot of my patients want to know what else can I do. Mm -hmm. They will be on their medications, but they feel that medications do not really mm -hmm. help with all their symptoms. They, it yeah. might, as you said, I do have um, um, patients who stopped having migraine headaches, but the vertigo never went away. The right. dizziness is, is, is severe, and that is not really easy for them to manage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so a couple other tips I can think of, you know, especially in the moment of a vertigo attack would be... Um, uh, especially if it's uh, if there's nausea, is ginger. So sometimes ginger candies, ginger tea, um, those types of things, if you can take them um, during an attack. I know a lot of people can't really keep much down, but just sipping on something like that can be helpful. Um, using ice, so ice pack on the back of the neck, on the head, on the hands sometimes is a good one. Um, uh, what else? Um, Focusing. So if there is kind of a spinning sensation happening, if you can open your eyes and try to focus on something about 10, 15 feet away and just keep looking at it, um, that can sometimes help stop that spinning sensation as well. Um, so I always also get this question, um, heat or cold? <laughs> yeah, so it depends on the problem. So obviously for migraine, in a migraine attack, I would say cold is going to kind of help dampen things and close, you know, blood vessels and whatnot. But um, heat is always good for muscle relaxation. So if you have stiff muscles, tight neck, all that kind of stuff, uh, you, you'll you be wanting to do some heat and stretching in between um, in between attacks and just to kind of relax and loosen up those muscles. So a lot of the way that migraine is described is that it starts with the stiffening of the neck or pain and tension in the neck and the shoulders. Yeah. And then it goes in like people know it's it's going to happen because of that first. Yeah. So would would you think that at that point, just starting with heat and as soon as the headache starts, we can um, kind of switch. Would yes. you think that might help a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I think that's probably a good strategy. I would try that. And if that works great, if you feel, you know, there's really no harm in either or. So if you, for some reason, really want to use heat during your migraine, there's that's not going to harm anything it's, it, if it's if it helps you. So you kind of have to play around with it and, and see what helps you. If you feel like ice feels really good on your stiff muscles, then there's no harm in that. So it's just so these things tend to work um, in, in one way, but for some people, they work totally opposite. So just finding what works for you. Perfect. I, um, then the next question that I also had based on, on what um, our... Uh, patients are saying mm -hmm. um, is the hormonal you said that you see a lot of uh, during hormonal changes mm -hmm. uh, menopause 
uh, with menopause comes also a little bit of uh, bone density changes mm-hmm. and a little bit of skeletal or uh, you know muscular Postural, yep. postural uh, changes if you um, were to advise someone who is living with migraine and who also is starting to uh, go into peri- uh, perimenopause just mm-hmm. before they go into menopause or just starting to to, to go through menopa- menopause um, to exercise what kind of exercise do you think they need to actually start at that at that point? Yeah, good question. So um, as you mentioned, bone density can start to decrease around that time as well. So um, weight bearing exercises are always the most um, beneficial at that time. So uh, exercises such as walking, jogging, you know, body weight type exercises, squats, lunges, um, um, things that are less body weight, such as um, like cycling, swimming, those kinds of things are less beneficial for bone density because you're not putting weight through your bones and your bones need that stimulus to be able to um, create new bone and stay strong. So that is um, the most important type of exercise. Um, It's funny you mentioned osteoporosis as well because um, osteoporosis or people, women with osteoporosis are at a higher um, risk of getting BPPV, that inner ear um, crystal uh, problem that causes vertigo. So, uh, so bone density is really important um, in preventing that type of uh, vertigo as well. Um, you know, vitamin D and calcium, as we know, are, are really important uh, as well. But, um, but yeah, the, the weight bearing exercise and, and weight bearing exercise and resistance training. So um, muscle strengthening. So exercises that um, increase muscle strength using weights. So I think, you know, your bicep curl, your, um, your squats, your um, weight lifting type exercises, you don't have to be using giant barbells or anything, but um, things where the muscle is actually pulling on the bone to strengthen the muscle um, can actually strengthen your bones as well. So I do have a question from Susan, Mm -hmm. uh, who is asking, why does bone density affect uh, BBPV? Good question. So because BPPV uh, is a problem of um, these small calcium carbonate crystals in your inner ear that help with position sense. So those small crystals in your inner ear, uh, as we age, they can start to deteriorate and become thinner, just like um, your bone. And so it is there. Think of them as tiny rocks of bone in your inner ear that are kind of rolling around and helping you sense uh, acceleration and deceleration. Um, but as we age and, and if we are uh, developing osteoporosis, those small little rocks and bones will be deteriorating just as your other bones are. So um, as they deteriorate, they're more likely to um, break free and, and, and go into the wrong position, which is going to um, cause BPPV. And I, I do have uh, some of my patients saying that they go for a some sort of an adjustment um, uh, for these crystals. Can you explain to us what that means? Yeah. I'm, I'm finding it difficult to understand what exactly. Yeah. I have a model here. I can show you with this. So, um, so this is uh, your vestibular system. So this is actually your hearing portion of your inner ear, but these are the canals of the uh, vestibular s- system and they're filled with fluid. Um, and in the center part here, this vestibule, that's where those small, tiny calcium carbonate crystals live. They are kind of stuck down in the middle of this area on the floor and they sense that linear deceleration, acceleration um, as uh, that's their normal function. But as we move around and as we get older and for other reasons, if we have a head injury or whatever, those cu- small crystals might pop off and start to go into these fluid filled canals. And when they're in there, that's why that's where the vertigo starts is because as we turn our head, roll over in bed, lay down or sit up, um, if there's, imagine there's a, if I go this way, if there's a few tiny crystals or we call them, you know, you can call them rocks or, or autoliths uh, in there. If I go to lay down or sit up, those small crystals are actually going to cause the fluid to move faster than it um, normally does. And when it moves faster, uh, it sends di- it sends different signals to the brain um, and uh, than it normally does. And that's when our brain gets confused because these 
canals are, are normally sending information to our brain about how our head is moving. That's what these canals are for. They tell our, our brain where our head is and what, what direction it's moving. Um, and so when there's kind of debris in there, it'll change that signal and cause vertigo. And and to, how do you reset it? Like oh yes, that was the question. Yes. <laughs> Good, thank you. Yeah, so that that's what happens. Now, how do we fix it? It's actually really cool. So um, because they're heavy and we know where they are based on your symptoms, uh, we can we can flush them out using gravity. So we use something often called the Epley maneuver, but there are several other maneuvers as well that can help. Uh, but what the Epley maneuver will do if those crystals are, let's say they're kind of stuck in the back of this canal, we lay you down. Um, so the, all those crystals are going to kind of uh, gather here. We'll turn your head a little bit, then we'll turn it the other way. We'll roll you over and then come back up. And that actually flushes the crystals out and back into the middle of the canal. So it's a gravity dependent um, maneuver that uses gravity to flush those crystals out. The, the key with that is that you're doing it in, <coughs> excuse me, in, um, in a very precise way so that the angles that you're doing it at is is causing those crystals to move out um because if you if you miss a step or if you're not quite doing the angles properly it's not going to work it can sometimes even get worse if you're doing the maneuvers improperly so that's that's what that is um i have uh, a few more questions so just give me a second uh oh we seem to have oh there you are <laughs> Uh, so the next question is, uh, what <coughs> medications are used to help with dizziness? Good question. So again, not my, not my, um, um, you know, uh, scope necessarily medication wise. I do, and maybe Heba, you can help me answer this question a little bit, but um, I do see um, CERC is one of them that is gets prescribed a lot. Um, the one thing with CERC or beta histine uh, is that um, it's an antihistamine that helps um, with dizziness, but I, I do find that it it's not, um, often people get put on it and it's not really doing a whole lot. So often I'll send a note to the doctor uh, asking if we can slowly wean off of that medication because um, it can actually dampen the what the vestibular system is doing. It can, um, it can suppress the vestibular system a little bit, which might make our exercises less effective. So beta histine is one that if you don't need to be on it, um, it's better to, to wean off of it. Um, another one that uh, a, a lot of times for vestibular migraine and PPPD and, and some of these other uh, vestibular disorders, a lot of times it is like SSRIs and SNRIs that get prescribed um, that do end up helping a fair bit. So I don't know if you can add to that, Heba. Yes, and, and, and we do have um, a, a, a medications that are prescribed. Beta histine is the one that is most commonly prescribed. Um, it does give um, good benefit to mm -hmm. to a to patients and you need to decide if this is the best one for you yeah you have um people coming back and saying yeah it takes away my dizziness but it makes me very sleepy so is this which one are you going to uh or it makes me very nauseous mm -hmm. um, so it, it depends on if how you tolerate um the, the medication but also um, how, how good it works and how much you can tolerate this medication. I have another question um, around uh, migraine and preteens. For preteens, can hormones be the cause of migraine? Um, hormones do play a role in migraine in, at all stages. And what we need to do is we need to Number one, acknowledge that there's a genetic uh, reason why there is migraine, and uh, we need to. Sorry. <laughs> and we need to make sure that, um, you know, migraine in children is, uh, children and adolescents is 10% uh, of, of the population. It's a very common condition. There's a genetic factor. Hormones do play um, a role, especially that it starts with 10% of boys and girls, but more girls, four more, um, gr four more times girls, um, continue to have or develop migraine versus only 8% of men get migraine. So there is a hormonal factor. But having said this, sometimes you do 
try to provide hormonal therapy or replacement therapy or whatever, and it doesn't help with the migraine. So it's not only one reason. Hormones do play a role, but they might not be the only reason why someone has migraine. Um, someone said, um, very good overview of vestibular. That's Susan again. Um, vestibular migraine had it for four years. Nausea was my worst issue. I used Cirque PRN, and it seems to help more than it did as a regular dose. Mm -hmm. and that is, I, I don't know what, what you can say to that, Lauren. No, I was just going to say, I do have some patients that do that or, or that their doctor uh, recommend that they just take it as needed and that, that works for them. Yeah. Um, I, 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 um, I see the same. I see more um, use when needed. Mm -hmm. um, and the nausea is the worst issue. As she said, the nausea is my my worst issue, but we do have anti -nauseans. We do mm -hmm. have medications that are great for nausea. And um, um, some of them are even proved to help with migraine itself. They work on, on um, some of these receptors that, that mm. actually help with migraine. And some are uh, tablets, but some of them are all dissolving films. You just put them on your, on your tongue and they dissolve. So if you're nauseating and if you throw up, we know that the absorption is in the mm. mouth. Um, some of them come as uh, suppositories. So there's a lot that we can do for nausea and, and uh, we can talk about nausea, I think, at another. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a big one. Exactly. Nausea is one that my patients deal with a lot as well. And, and oftentimes I'll say we, you know, with vestibular therapy, with the exercise we're doing, you know, the exercises generally aren't going to help with the nausea, they're going to help with the dizziness. So if nausea is the biggest thing for you, we need to figure out how to get that curbed and in check before we do a lot of exercises. So I'll often send people back to their doctor to get to get some sort of prescription for the nausea. And there's no one size fits all with migraine. I've I've seen hundreds of patients, and um, I've never seen two have exactly <laughs> the same symptoms or the same concerns or the same. Um, the medication works for some, doesn't work for others, and the priorities change. So I do have Lucy saying I take gravel uh, for nausea, and I know that um, um, gravel is also a little bit the one. Some of the side effects of the, of the medications that we do have for migraine are actually uh, uh, causing um, a little bit of, again, dizziness, drowsiness, okay. and that affects um, that affects movement. I'm sorry, I have background noise. Sorry for okay. that. <laughs> I'm trying to mute myself, but life is happening. We are, we are at home. Sorry about that. No, no problem. No problem. Um, yeah, I would agree with all of that. So, um, you know, nausea needs to be, um, we have great medications and strategies for nausea that, uh, that um, we can use to, to help with migraine for sure. Yeah. Let me try and find out if I have missed um, some of the symptoms. Um, what else thanks I've heard this before thank you very much i mean for gravel if it works for you the answer is continue to take it if it doesn't work for you there are prescription medications that we can recommend and we can uh, direct you towards these um the question i have is children and um i'm i've just started a an online uh, series around migraine and children and it's uh, it's amazing the messages that I'm getting from parents saying I, I don't know what to do to help my my child um, what can can a child see a physiotherapist at this age if someone is eight or nine do you feel that they might benefit from seeing a physiotherapist you think? yeah yeah absolutely yes so any age can benefit from physiotherapy in terms of vestibular physiotherapy if dizziness and nausea and vertigo is a big part of their um their symptom list then vestibular therapy might be the way to go if it's more typical migraine then you know a, a physiotherapist who deals uh, with migraine is um is a great option there are also pediatric vestibular or sorry pediatric physiotherapists um, and, and, you know, fully pediatric physiotherapy clinics out there that um, that would be a little bit more specialized in working with children. But absolutely, um, there's there's lots of strategies. It's a great route to go as well, because we don't necessarily want 
um, our children to be relying on on only medications either. We want them to have kind of that whole um, treatment pie, as they say. So so physiotherapy can be one um, one adjunct to add to that as well. Well, if we don't have a lot of medications that are approved or tested in children. So our the kind of our arsenal for children is much, much less than um, for adults. So any, yeah. anything we can do to help them uh, is, is appreciated. Um, I do have Caroline who's asking, hi, Lauren. I've been told in the past by a vestibular PT that I had too many chronic migraine days for, the, for PT to be effective. Hmm. Uh, he believed that my brain would have been too overloaded. Do you also share this belief or do you feel that chronic migraine can still improve? That's an interesting question. It and is an interesting question. It's I, I kind of see where this therapist is coming from in, in that, um, you know, if you're having migraines every few days, um, doing therapy, you want to be doing therapy on your good days. And, um, you know, if, if it's sometimes in the beginning, if you're, if you're starting out too quickly, you may trigger more migraines or, you know, it's a bit of a game to try to figure out what, um, what exercises are helpful and what exercises are not. So, um, so no, I don't think that, I do think that physiotherapy can still be helpful for chronic migraines, but um, it needs to be in conjunction with a whole plan. So um, physiotherapy alone, I don't think would be the answer to a, you know, a fully chronic migraine problem. Um, you need to, excuse me, <clears throat> you need to uh, um, have the whole plan, especially if it's, if it's a, you know, a severe chronic migraine problem having the medication side and the, you know, having a specialist who's going to um, find that right concoction for you as well, alongside of the therapy. So that's maybe where, where he was coming from in that, you know, physio is not the answer right now until we can get things a little bit more under control. Um, but you wouldn't be able to help someone with chronic migraine. We do yeah. have a lot of our members that live with chronic migraine. Oh, exactly. Yeah, no. And 15 migraine days per month. So I do think that we could. Yes. I, yes. Yeah, sorry if, if you misunderstood, but no, yes, I do think physiotherapy can help with chronic migraine. I just, I do think that it's one part of a whole plan. So it's not the only, you know, if you're only doing that, you may not see huge improvements. Um, you have to have it as part of a full plan. Okay. I'm, I think we have a few minutes left. I think my, my next question has to do with coverage. Uh, cost, um, it's um, the burden of migraine does not only lie with the pain, but also with the cost and the, uh, the burden, the financial burden. Sure. With the medications, a lot of the medications are not covered right. by the government. If you're on a public plan, then it doesn't cover a lot of the medications. Almost all medications for migraine are excluded, which is such a big wow. uh, disappointment for our community. But I was, I was going to ask if someone needs uh, physiotherapy, what mm -hmm. is the coverage looking like? Yeah, so physiotherapists are not covered by OHIP unless you're in the hospital or um, I think, I do believe there is some coverage for um, for children under 18, uh, but, but no, so we're not covered, um, but we often are covered under extended health benefits plans. So um, if you have benefits through work, oftentimes there's a, you know, per calendar year amount that's covered under your benefits and vestibular, like our vestibular therapists were all physiotherapists. So physiotherapy is usually under that umbrella. So if you have coverage that way, then that can certainly um, go towards some vestibular therapy. Um, yeah, so, and it's always good to ask your therapist if they're able to work within your coverage or within your means. So, um, uh, you know, they may say you need to see us three times a week for three months. And, you know, you may say, well, that's great, but I won't be able to to do that. It doesn't mean you don't, you can't do it at all. They may say, well, then let's tr come up with a slightly different plan where we're maybe only seeing you once every couple of weeks and you do more of a home program or something like that. Um, um, I mean, for us, we, we would like to have as many options as, as possible. And um, I myself, like, like you, I think we have it in common that we do virtual care. And that means that um, 
we are more accessible so people can be in their own homes uh, when they do contact us when they get the care that we provide do you um, again do you feel that there is something uh, that can be done virtually um, that can, that needs to be done um, physically that you are not able to do uh, virtually and occasionally yeah occasionally there not very often so most of the time i can do everything that i need to do virtually occasionally there's something that i just need to feel or that i just can't quite see through a camera uh, and then i'll help that person find a local vestibular therapist or refer them back to their doctor for um for you know further testing but generally um i haven't had very many people that i haven't been able to see Okay, I think I have uh, just a few minutes. Uh, again, I would like to, to thank you. Any final words uh, to our audience, to our uh, viewers tonight? Um, I, again, thank you for joining us. This is one of many um, events that we will be having with Migraine Canada to talk about other, um, other ways we can help people living with migraine. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, I think people who live with migraine are such warriors to to live with that. And, and um, it's great now that we have social media and this type of thing to be able to, um, you know, have everybody here to listen to a live presentation while we're all just sitting at home this evening. It's so cool. So I'm, I'm so glad that you guys are doing this and, uh, and that uh, hopefully I can help um, have helped some people learn a little bit tonight. I think I had some, some people say they'd never, never heard of this type of migraine. It is very under um, represented, but it, it's, uh, it's getting more and more known. So it's um, something uh, that, uh, that we should all be aware of. So even the science hasn't caught up with vestibular migraine. We know that we do not have very clear criteria. I'm, you said something about, um, you know, sometimes the migraine, the headaches go away, but the vertigo gets worse. And I do have a patient who has exactly that condition. And her doctor told her then it wasn't vestibular migraine. If there's no migraine and you're still dizzy, that's not vestibular. Yeah, so that's something that's, they just don't vertigo. That's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's wrong. So, you know, exactly the the medical community, the, the science is coming out and, and, you know, the criteria is there, but the whole medical community may not be aware of those changes yet. So that's where we need to have more awareness. Um, I have um, Susan saying, great, I follow a U.S. group, but uh, now I'm happy to be uh, <laughs> part of Migraine Canada. You are welcome. This is, uh, yes, it's Migraine Canada. We welcome um, anybody who would like to learn more about migraine. Um, we are trying to make our questions a little bit more relevant to Canada when it comes to medications that are available, uh, services and coverage. And um, if you do have any question, um, if you think of any question, please uh, um, write it. Even after the event, we will try to look at it and answer it. And we thank you very much for being a part of this uh, event tonight. Uh, we enjoyed um, the, the the questions. I think uh, Lauren and and me have. Um, it's it's always a pleasure to be able to talk um, and and see how we can help the community and people living with migraine. Um, it is very, very important for us to be hopeful and to know that there's not one solution. There's not one magic pill. We need to look and we need to investigate and try. And then if something doesn't work, there's always something else to try. Uh, physical therapy or physiotherapy, I feel, is a very, very important part. And, um, and I'm very happy that uh, Lauren um, accepted our invitation tonight. It's it's always a pleasure. Uh, I think you did. Uh, um, um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share your um, details again. So she is on Facebook and Instagram, and this is her email. So if you need to contact her, please refer to this event so that she knows you joined us to, to, uh, tonight and. Again, thank you very much for joining us. Have a very good night. Enjoy the weekend. And uh, can I say uh, happy Halloween? I don't know if that's... <laughs> I love <laughs> happy Halloween, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, everyone. Have a very good, good evening. Bye. Bye.